Good morning, uh, Dr. Clayton Schillingford. Clayton Arthur Schillingford. Am I correct? You are very correct. Outstanding. Uh, today's date, August 16th, 2023. I'm here with the imminent Dominican born botanist, a botanic scientist, Dr. Clayton Arthur Schillingford. Um, and we're here to discuss the Dominican Botanic Gardens past, present, and future. And this uh, recording is timely because it comes on the heels of statements made in Parliament by the Member of Parliament for Roseau, that is the Prime uh, uh, Roosevelt Skerritt's wife, Melissa Popon Skerritt, who uh, spoke to plans for a uh, miniature, miniature golf course and entertainment center, creative arts center, water park, uh, uh, I think uh, cinema and other things, kitchens, restaurants, all within the 40 or so acres of the Dominican Botanic Gardens, the website for which was developed, maintained by the Dominican Academy of Arts and Sciences, of which you were the president. And interestingly, your professional occupation was that of but botanist. You are yes. an eminent botanist. So I thought it important. I interviewed Dr. Schillingford yesterday, Davidson Schillingford, who was the web, web man, website manager and developer. And today I want to interview you uh, and uh, Dr. Schillingford. You are the President Emeritus of the Dominica Academy of Arts and Sciences. Is that correct? That is correct, yes. Now, Dr. Schillingford, where were you born and when were you born? Born in Dominica, April 25, 1936. And who was your mother and who was your father? My father is Sesky Schillingford and my mother is Gladys Philip from Mahu. Indeed. And, and uh, Dr. Schillingford, I, I know you had several siblings, if you want to name them. Uh, my siblings? Yes, sir. Well, on my mother's side, there is my brother, Bob Peters, because my mother was married to Diane Peters, Bob Peters, Randy Peters, Merle Peters, Danny Peters, Glenn Peters, and Sandra Peters. Indeed. And Clayton, where did you attend school? Where did I go to school? Yes, sir. Well, I went to a private school first when I was a very young person. Then my mother sent me to another private school called St. Joseph's School. And then from St. Joseph's School, I went to the Roseau Mix School. Where and, and Dr. Schilling for the Rosso Mixington School in those days seemed to have been a very illustrious uh, uh, entity. Yes. Well, there were a lot of uh, persons, you know, at that school who in their subsequent years achieved quite a lot, not only in Dominica, but outside of Dominica. For example, Ronald here became a very important man in the banking system in Jamaica, for example. Others went to England. There was, at that time, a very active migration to England by Dominicans who thought that they would have better uh, um, opportunities for their ambitions in England rather than staying in Dominica. And Dominica, of course, at that time was a British territory. Well, it, colony. Was, it was a colony. This period we are talking about is after the Second World War, when things settled down in Europe. And a lot of our citizens thought they would be better off in England than in Dominica. So they left and went to England. And the younger ones, of course, they took the opportunity of improving their education in England. Yes. And Clayton, where did you go to school after the Roseau Mixington School? And how did you get there? Was it a scholarship or a bursary? The Roseau Mix School, there was a system in the island that scholarships would be arranged for students from the primary school to go to secondary school. In my case, there was an examination. And if you came first in the exam, 
you were allowed to go to the grammar school, the Dominico grammar school, which was a school for boys. You go to the grammar school without paying any fees for attendance at the school. As, as luck would have it, my father pay, played a role in that whole thing because when he came to Dominica, he presented to me an arrangement. If you came first in the exam to go to the ground school, I will present you with a bicycle. So, of course, I came first in the exam and the bicycle was brought to Dominica, a humble bicycle, because my father was running the lime factory that belonged to the shilling funds. He was running that lime factory in Grenada. Anyway, he brought the bicycle. And so I got my bicycle for having attained position number one. In this well, Trayton, let me just put a, a pin in there because this video will be seen by many young people. And it's important for them to understand the value engineering that made for your success. So you've told me in a prior discussion what you had to do to come first. And I think it's important for you to explain what you did and how that involved the Rosso Public Library and your study habits. Do you mind? Certainly. Well, once my father made that promise that I would get a bicycle for going to be number one in the exam, Naturally, I realized at that instant, I couldn't continue my boyhood pranks of going to the Windsor Park and to the river every day, wasting time. So I decided I was going to give up all of these activities and I was going to concentrate on the books, which is what I did. I concentrated on the books. These were books that the colonial authorities gave to the schools. And I decided that I was going to put a lot of time and focus in those books so that when I went into the exam, I would be able to answer all of the relevant questions and attain the position number one which was my ambition at the time. So that's what I did. I retired from all playing and fooling around and so on. And I stayed home and I studied those books page by page. And so when I went into the exam, I was able to adequately respond to the questions that were in the question paper. Clayton, you told me that uh, you in those days you were doing pounds, shillings, and pence, and you had to do calculations. Tell us a bit about that before we go on to talk about the gardens. Well, yes, that made the mathematics, the arithmetic, a bit complicated because the currency at the time, pounds, shillings, and pence, if at this present time we have to think about it, that you have to have 12 pence in a shilling and 20 shillings in a pound. And what is worse, in the lower levels, not only did you have a penny, but you also had a farthing. And the farthing, four farthings were required to make up a penny. So if you had a mathematical problem stated in words on the question paper, for you to work out, things got very, very complicated for you to be able to maneuver from pence to shillings, shillings to pound. And before you get to, to pence, you have to talk about pennies and farthings. That is correct. But I also remember, because I'm also a graduate of the Rosa Mixins Infant School, after you, of course, on the Floss Christian, you, you, I remember in those days we had a penny, but we had a, something called a halfpenny. A halfpenny was, was a halfpenny. A halfpenny, yes. We had that as well. 
which made things even more complicated. Yes, so, indeed. Okay. Let me uh, let me uh, uh, let me uh, say this, uh, Clayton. What role did the gardens, the botanic gardens, play in Dominican society at that time? Well, the gardens was a place where people went for relaxation. People went for uh, viewing the beauty and diversity of plant life at that time. And there, were, there was that section of the gardens. And there was also what one would call an economic section. And in the economic section, the botanical garden staff, they had the commercial varieties of plants there in various nurseries. You could go and you could buy coffee, cocoa, and so on, if you wanted to start your own uh, gardens or you wanted to start to plant these things in a plantation on your property. Those seedlings were available for you to go and buy them and not to have to do it yourself. What is more, of course, they had at the time varieties that were recognized as superior because any of those crops that you mentioned, the varieties over the years were improved by breeding and so on and so on. So that was one major advantage of the gardens that you could go to the economic section and you could buy your plants there at that time. But you also had the other section, which was really uh, more of what I would call uh, a botanical uh, museum where you could go and see all of the varieties, the varieties of plants that were brought from various parts of the British Commonwealth, Africa and so on. And they were brought to Dominica and planted there. But these were not plants that you would normally see in Dominica. Yes, they were not native to the island. They were not native to the island, correct. So you had things like lychee and mangosteen and a whole lot of other varieties from the furthest riches of the British Empire. Correct. And um, you, you mentioned uh, coffee and cocoa, but you also had a lot of citrus, limes and grapefruits. A lot of citrus varieties. Pombolo yeah. and tangerines. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, I, 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 I hear it, I, I heard it from good, I heard it in such a way as to believe it to be true that there were many young people who had sometimes in the dark of night tried to go to the agriculture station. Well, the, situ the situation was very attractive for young fellows to go over there and shall we say, harvest the produce in the commercial section. And the easiest way to get there without being seen was to go at night. You could climb over the wall because the, the garden's gates would be closed, but you could climb over the wall. You could go to the back and you could harvest the citrus and the mango and whatever else was available at the time. So that's what we did. But generally security was very strict, is not correctly? Yes, well, there, there was, there was a guard, you know, at the, at the gardens who in particular would parade the economic section and make sure that no one was going there and interfering with the produce. So we had to go in the night. And it's also the case, Clayton, that the uh, parades like uh, Empire Day and Queen's Birthday as well would be held on the lawn of the Botanic Gardens. That is correct. And all of the major uh, inter-island cricket matches were also played 
at the gardens because we didn't have we didn't have uh, any other playground on which we had the facilities for playing, especially cricket. And at that time, there was an inter-island cricket tournament going on between St. Russia, St. Vincent, Grenada, and Dominica. And this was practically every year. So that took place at the, at the Botanical Gardens. The cricket pitch was built there. When you, when you went to the gardens as a student, you also were not only going as a grammar school student, but you were a cadet officer, I was told. You were a cadet, is that correct? That is correct. The cadets went to the gardens on a regular basis for marches, which were organized by the staff member who was responsible for the cadets. So we did that on a regular basis. In fact, every week on a Friday afternoon, we marched from the Dominica Grammar School on Hillsborough Street, and we marched through the gardens. And then of course, from the gardens, we marched back to the school. Yeah, that happened. And, and who was the commanding officer in your days at the grammar school? Well, it was, uh, Vivian Grell, we used to call him Vivian Porcus Grell. He was the staff member who was responsible for uh, helping the cadets to get organized, including getting the appropriate costumes through the headmaster at the time, Mr. Victor Archer. So the boots and the, the hose and and the, and the cadet headwear, all of that had to be obtained. So that's... Yes? You want to get your nebulizer? Um, Are you busy now? Right now? No, no. If you're busy, that's okay. I come back later. All right, come back later. Okay, thank you. Thank that, you, Clayton. That was the nurse there. Uh, she coming to give me something for my... Um, breathing. Yes, indeed. And I, I won't keep you long because I understand your situation, but I'm so thankful that we have you with us because I'm going to ask you about did the gardens and your involvement as a, as a cadet, as a student coming to study there, use the gardens, influence your interest in botanic science? Absolutely. No question about it. Uh, the botanical gardens was a place where you began to learn the rudiments of botanical science, how plants were named, who named them, what were all these various plant families, and, and, and so on. And then, of course, you had to connect the anatomical features of the plant to the family to which it belongs. So you understood that all of the, the palms were in one sector and all of the, what we call the broadleaf plants, they were in, in another sector. So you began to learn how plants were classified and how one plant related to the other. And uh, the anatomical, uh, structure. You had to learn about that. Trees were different from shrubs. Shrubs were different from herbs. And so you had to learn all of that. And in fact, when I did my study on the Dominican rainforest, I went into even further detail because leaves had to be measured. And the size the girth of the stem had to be measured. The height of the plant had to be measured. So uh, I had to do all of that. And then if there were one set of plants, depending on, on another set, for example, the orchids were in a group of plants called epiphytes. The orchids 
never grew in the soil. They grew on another plant. And so this- So you're saying to me that the orchid is almost like a parasite then? Correct. But the orchid was not a parasite. The orchid just needed something on which they could wrap the, the roots around, but then they were able to absorb their own water and they were able to absorb their own nutrients from the back of the tree on which they were sitting. So this were the epiphytes, but we did have real parasites and the real parasites were not green because they didn't have chlorophyll to be able to use up the oxygen of the sun. So those were totally dependent on the other plant on which they were sitting. So the Give me an example, Clayton, of a parasite that we had in Dominica. There was a plant there called a dada, and it was yellow. And it would put its roots through the surface of the tree on which it was sitting. And it was then able, if you like, to borrow some nutrients from the tree. So Clayton, how important in the development of a nation and its agriculture, its food security, is the study of botanic science? And how important is that study of botanic science and the interplay with a botanic gardens? Well, the botanical gardens were set up by the botanical scientists from Kew Gardens. And the purpose of that with the gardens was to set up those two sections, which I mentioned. The economic section to help the development of agriculture in their tropical agriculture. And the other section was a section that would be available for the pleasure and uh, enjoyment of Dominicans who wanted to go to the gardens and see plants which were not economically important in the sense that they did not produce any crop but they were equally important to be seen in the variety of nature in a tropical island. I mean, we had practically every exotic plant in the gardens at that, at that time. And uh, the section, which was the economic section, they helped development of the economic uh, section of agri agriculture. And they helped the coffee, cocoa, bananas, plantains, and in the old days, the big thing was sugarcane because sugarcane became very, very important even before the diversified agriculture of Dominica. Sugarcane was important because you could get more molasses out of that, but more important, you could have this thing uh, prepared to make rum. So my family, for example, they made rum at Chekhov, they made rum at Makushri, and even to the present time, the Makushri estate still makes rum from sugarcane. Indeed. Clayton, let me ask you about your education. Where did you go to college after you left the grammar school? Well, grammar school, uh, Asha was so in, in, interested in building science, he created at the time the form beyond the fifth form, which was the sixth form. And he had in the new building that he put next to River Street, the ground floor was devoted to laboratories to help understand the scientific 
principles of botany. So there were microscopes there, and even in the chemistry area, there was equipment to do chemistry as, as well. So with that in place, after you did your sixth form exam, you were then qualified to go to the University of the West Indies in particular, because with the sixth form background, that gives you entry into the science faculty. So I didn't have a scholarship. Osborne Revere got a scholarship to go to the university in Jamaica, but he got a scholarship because the government thought they needed somebody to come back to teach French. So Osborne was given a scholarship to do French. What the government did not do, they did not check to find out if Osborne had the entry requirements. Well, as it turns out, he did not. So he was not able to go into the arts faculty. And because he was not able to go into the arts faculty, by default, the government came and they said, well, would you take the scholarship and go and do French? Well, Gabe, I wanted to go to university. So I thought, you know what? I take the scholarship, I go to university, and then I persuade the university authorities to call the Dominican government and to say to them that I was more qualified to do science than to do French. Well, that didn't work because the university authority did exactly what I wanted them to do. And then the Dominican government responded, well, we are not going to do that. We gave Shane for a scholarship to do French. He must do French. Well, I spent one year in the arts faculty doing French. And at the end of that academic year, I bolted to Dominica on federal boat. And I went to the administrator at the time, Mr. Lindo, and I explained to Mr. Lindo my situation, that I was not that absorbed in doing French. I wanted to do science. I showed him all my certificates and he promptly wrote to the university and said, when Schillingford returns for his second academic year, he is to be transferred to the science faculty. And there I did in the science faculty, mathematics, chemistry, and botany. And that is what I have my first degree in. Indeed. And uh, Clayton, then you returned to Dominica and you became the science teacher and the developer of the new laboratory system at the new grammar school on Valley Road. Is that correct? That is correct. When I came back to Dominica, I came back to Dominica with the experience of working in those university laboratories. And even although I didn't have to bring those laboratories up to the standard of the university, I could bring it close enough that the science teaching at the grammar school, especially the grammar school when it moved from Hillgrove Street to Bath Estate, that particular move allowed me to secure uh, the room for those laboratories to be set up. And that's what I did. We had chemistry lab, we had botany, we had zoology, and we had physics, all of that. And then we, we ordered all of the necessary equipment from, I think the, the deal at the time, you ordered things to uh, Crown Council. Crown agent. Hmm? The Crown agent. Right, exactly. So we got, we got all of the equipment that was necessary for these laboratories, including more, more computers, not computers, more microscopes, glassware, and all of that. The 
the lab was sufficiently equipped that business people began to ask us to test some of the materials. For example, the bay oil, the Shillingford family would send bay oil samples for us to test that they met the standards that were required by the market, by the people who were buying the bay oil from Dominica. So we were able to do the test and to give them a report to show the constituents in the bay oil, the quantity of the constituents, and the purity of the bay oil. We were able to do that. Then I just want to commend you because I've spoken to several Dominican scientists and people who did things like medicine, like Dr. Sam Christian, for, for instance, Iwat Libla and others. And they all say that when they traveled to the United States to go to college, they were well prepared because of the sophisticated nature of the laboratory system that you set up at the grammar school at Baffer State of Valley Road in the early 1960s. So I want to salute you, sir, because your outstanding leadership in laboratory science really allowed for our people to go to North America, that is Canada, the United States, United Kingdom, and excel in their scientific education or their science education. So thank you again for that. Let me ask you, you did your master's in botany and where did you do the master's in botany? Well, I got my, I got my bachelor's degree from UWI. In That's Chemistry. UWI, Mona. Mona, correct. And also you got your first wife. <laughs> yes, also true, yes. yes. What was her name, Clayton? Yvonne. Yvonne okay. Johnson. And what was her, Yvonne Johnson, and, and you had children with her. Who were those children? Yeah. Give us your names. She, she, she was on the same campus there that the university uh, faculties were because she came to Mona at the time to go to uh, the university uh, medical section to become a nurse. I see. So there was a nurse training uh, outlet as well. So she came to do that. And I, I met her because naturally, since everybody was on the same campus, when you had social activities in the halls, the nurses came to this social uh, functions. And that's how I met her. And, yeah. and that, is, that is, you said Yvonne Johnson? Yvonne Johnson, yes. She was from uh, uh, she was from the rural area, a place called Baylistan, up in the mountains of of Jamaica, and her parents grew uh, the cro tropical crops. You know, coffee was a big thing, of course, in Jamaica, especially in the high altitudes. That's why you still have coffee called Blue Mountain coffee from Jamaica. That's right. And uh, you had two children by her? Correct. I had Ray and uh, Jillian. Ray passed away, but Jillian is around here. In fact, not very far from where I am sitting right now. I've had the high honor and privilege of meeting her. She's a very loving uh, daughter, a very kind person. My wife, Joan, and I uh, send to her through you our best regards. I yes. know she's taken very good care of her beloved father. That's correct. Yes, and of course she later on married married a, a fellow well, scientist, well. Margaret. Yes. 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 Well, she's doing very well. Yes, indeed. Clayton, yeah, so you, you you did your bachelor's at University of Western Mona, and where did you do your master's degree? Well, what happened was, after I did my bachelor's, I went back to Dominica, as you well explained, to teach, and also to be in charge of the sports program. But whilst I was there... Uh, by it, the way, you were, you were a very famous cricketer in Dominica in those days, weren't that's you? Also, that's also correct. Uh, at the grammar school at the time, it occurred to me that since I was teaching the students in botany certain aspects of the ecology of our uh, areas in Dominica, 
including the rainforest, it occurred to me that perhaps I could, during those visits, begin to look at the possibility of doing a study on the Dominican rainforest. So I called my supervisor, Dr. Dennis Adams, and I said, look, I would like to look into the possibility of doing a very intensive study of the Dominican rainforest, which was unusual in many ways, because this was the natural forest that was there before the colonists turned up. It was not, the rainforest was not a, a rainforest of plants that were brought in. These were plants that were there even during the Carib uh, habitation and all of that. Those plants was always there. And so, so Clayton, for people who will see this, they have to understand that Dominica was one of the countries that was last colonized because of the fierce resistance of the Caribs. And even after the Caribs were subdued and the Africans were, uh, enslaved Africans were brought in, they too rose up in a great many instances. And so a lot of the original rainforest remained had not been chopped down for sugarcane. Also the topography did not favor sugarcane, is that right? That's very, very correct. Very, very correct. Where the rainforest in the other islands had been chopped down for economic use of uh, wood and all that. In the case of Dominica, the rainforest, the natural rainforest remained intact for a long, long time without being destroyed. So it was that particular system that I began to study. One location was Global Me. Dr. Adams came down, we selected the areas, the other area was Tefem, and those two areas, they were ecologically different. Glogomir was on a slope, and Tefem was on flat land. And so the soil structure and the environment was sufficiently different that some of the species in Glogomir, you didn't find them in Tefem. So I was able to make a comparison between the two areas, between Tefem yes. and Glogomier. Glogomier was the soil uh, density or the, 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 the amount of soil you, you had before you got to hard packed rock. Was that much lower than in Tefem? The, the Glogomier soil was deeper and had a different capacity for holding water. Tefem was flat, the soil was shallow, and some of the plants even developed what we call aerial roots because they couldn't get enough oxygen from the soil. So the roots came out of the soil into the air so that the plant could get, the trees could get um, oxygen. So there was a difference in the, in the a distribution of plants in Glogomia and in Tefem. And how important do you think is that study of our forest, our soil type, to the development of our agriculture sector and it's linked to the botanic gardens? Well, the, the nature of the soil in Tefem and in Glogomia, they gave you a sense of the difference in the characteristic of the soil and what it would take to plant in those soils and what other things you could not plant because the soil was too shallow. So we could learn from the botanical distribution of the plants and also from the ecology from the soil structure of that. We could learn what the commercial plants would, would do well and which ones would not do well. We were okay. able to figure that out. And, and Clayton, uh, so your, your master's degree was on the rainforest of Dominica, is that correct? Correct. 
and your PhD, where did you obtain that? Well, I, I, I had a second master's degree because when I left Dominica and went back to Jamaica, not only to conclude my master's on the rainforest, but also it was time for me to get out of Dominica. I had already completed my obligation to the government because when the government gave me the scholarship to go to UWI, there was an arrangement at that time for you to have what is called a bond. And the bond was set up legally. You signed it, you got the scholarship, and you gave the government the assurance that when you finish with your degree, you come back to Dominica to serve in the public service. So after my bond was over, I was free to leave and all, everything kind of came uh, into, into a situation where my practical work on the, on the master's degree in Butterwood was complete and it was time for us to go back to Jamaica. So we went back, we made, went back to Jamaica for me to finish the write-up of my master's degree. At the same time that this was going on, the Jamaica Banana Board said they wanted somebody who had a very strong botanical background to go to England to do a second master's degree in plant pathology. The same time that I was being offered that, Wallace Ernst of the Smithsonian was offering me a position to come to the Smithsonian to do the usual taxonomic work at the Smithsonian. Well, that would have required my being in a lab all the time. On the other hand, if I did plant pathology, it got me into agriculture. So I decided to take the plant path scholarship that the banana board offered and go to England to the University of London and there I did a second master's degree. And I got my degree this time in plant pathology. So that put me squarely in the path of being able to do research and to operationally contribute to the, the banana business in Jamaica. And so I have, at that time, I have two master's degrees, one in botany and the other in plant pathology. And Did you so, become the research director at the Jamaican Banana Board? Yes, I, I did eventually, yes. Well, I had those two, those two degrees. And as luck would have it, because of my linkage with the University of London and the staff there and my performance at the time, I went to a plant pathology congress in Minneapolis, Minnesota. And as luck would have it, I am sitting at breakfast with a gentleman, Richard Ford. And who is Richard Ford? The head of the plant pathology section of the University of Illinois. So, of course, you know what happens in these professions. In these professions, internationally, the people who are in the field, they know each other. They either know each other personally or they know each other because they have communicated with each other in conferences and so on. So this gentleman, hearing that I had come from University of London with this master's degree in plant pathology, he said, well, why don't you come to Illinois to do your PhD? Well, Outstanding. And then you accepted that. Of course. Of course <laughs> and, what, and, and so you went to the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Correct. You got correct. your PhD in what area? Plant pathology. Outstanding. And then okay. when I returned back to Jamaica, here I was, two master's degrees in the sciences, and also a PhD 
in plant pathology. So the folks there in Jamaica, after a while, they decided that they would make me director of research to organize the research on bananas. All of the research areas, agronomy, entomology, plant pathology, set up the labs. So there I was setting up labs again and employing people who were already qualified in the areas that we needed for the bananas. Uh, Clayton, I just want to commend you for your studying leadership in science because that carried you very far. You did very well. I know you also were sent by Prime Minister Michael Manley to Cuba to even help the Cubans with your bananas. Is that correct? That is correct. My, my, Michael Manley, because <clears throat> the Cubans are very much interested in their bananas and plantains, they were having difficulty with a leaf disease. And Michael Manley sent me to Cuba in 1979 to help the Cubans to deal with that disease, what they should apply, what varieties they should select and so on. So I went to Cuba for a little, little over a week to advise them on the very matter of plant selection and treatment, yes. And Clayton, I, I want to ask that. So, I, And then there came a time that you left Jamaica and you took up a position at DuPont Labs in DuPont, Delaware. Yes, well, that uh, happened in a rather, a rather strange way to be honest with you. Um, whilst I was still in Jamaica, the Dominican government offered me the position to be head of the organization, Dominica Banana Growers Association. And I accepted the position. And on my way to Dominica with my family, my wife and my two kids, the hurricane came through and wiped out the bananas. That's Hurricane David. Hurricane David, correct. Of 1979. 1979. So there were no bananas. And whilst I was there, I called Dr. Sinclair, who was my supervisor, University of Illinois. And Sinclair offered me the position to come back to Illinois as a visiting professor and to help him in his own research. So my wife and my two kids left Dominica. At the time, there was a lot of criticism of myself because the Dominican authorities, their position was, I was offered a position in Dominica and I should stay put. Well, I didn't stay put. I went back to the United States of America, to Illinois. I already had my PhD in my pocket. And whilst I was there, Sinclair said, well, look, this is what we can do. For you to get back in the business of doing science, we can arrange for you to get a job at the DuPont company, and then you can have your science knowledge utilized there, but in a commercial way. So I went and I had an interview in Chicago with the manager there at the time, I don't remember his name. And then he said, yes, you, you have a job. So I left Illinois, Urbana Champaign, and I went to Wilmington and worked in Wilmington, Delaware for a few months before the company decided since you have expertise in bananas, we will move you to Coral Gables, Florida. And there you will have access to all of the banana growing areas in Latin America, as well as the Caribbean. So that's how that started. And the company thought I had done a sufficiently good job in helping the users of their products decided well, 
will make you now banana development manager worldwide, which then gave me access to the Philippines, North Australia, all of West Africa, where bananas were also grown for export. So I was responsible for Latin America and the Caribbean, but my expertise then spread to West Africa and to the Pacific area. So you became the director for uh, banana development worldwide for DuPont Labs, is that correct? That is correct. And it was in that position, Clayton, that in the early 2000s, late to 1999, thereabouts, uh, you were contacted by Raglan Rivera with regard to the formation of the Dominica Academy of Arts and Sciences. That is correct, yes. And you became the first president of the Dominica Academy. Correct. Well, those Raglan, who will... Raglan was a very old friend of mine at the Dominica Academy. One of my. Go on. Put your camera back on, please. So you're saying that you knew Raglan as a fellow cadet at the grammar school? Yeah, but I also knew him as an athletic competitor for the inter uh, house competition because he was at the time in schoolhouse and I was in Skinner House. And here was this gentleman challenging me in high jump and pole vault and all of that. And I decided I'm not having any of that business. I am going to practice and practice and practice all of the essential events that I would come first in everything. So I came first in pole vault, I came first in high jump, and I came first in the throwing events, including throwing the cricket ball. And I then, uh, with Archer gave me the additional uh, title of Victor Ludorum because I was then so-called Victor of the Games. Yes, so yeah. That yeah. is how I knew. That is how I knew Raglan. But I also, I also knew Raglan in class because he was in sixth form at the same time that was there doing mathematics. I see. You okay? see, so. So that personal relationship, because um, I contacted Raglan in 98, 99, he had a website called Sir Raglan Presents, and he was writing about Dominicans who had been successful in the sciences, in academia, and in life. And I contacted him, I said, why don't we work together and we can pull together a roster of Dominicans who are qualified, create an academy of arts and sciences online, because you don't have money to do a building, and we can offer our services to the island of our birth. And he thought it was a good idea, good for him. He was a very patriotic Dominican, very diligent man. And he said, I know the exact person to fit the bill as president. And that's how your name came up as uh, the uh, president. And we met, you may have forgotten that, but uh, we met and within well, one year, <laughs> within one year, we had this uh, symposium at the Brooklyn Marriott, which you presided over. And I want to compliment you for an outstanding achievement because there's never been a gathering of Dominican scientists and professionals from at home and abroad since. Right. No, we did very well. We did very well. It's unfortunate that the government at the time and even now did not see the value of that pool of talent that was made available to them at the time. Because had they done that, they would have been able to build not only our agriculture, but the other major sectors of the economy, including tourism. And the prime minister did write to us, DAS, to me personally, and said, why don't you prepare a policy document for the consideration of the Dominican government to bring Dominica private and public sector closer to the Dominica diaspora. And Raglan then took time to find every qualified Dominican he could find in Canada, the United States, and Europe. 
and to bring them together in the directory with their qualifications. And we made all of that available to the Dominican government that they would be able to consult with persons like that and to help these various economic uh, uh, links that, that we were developing. Unfortunately, that didn't work very well because there were people in the government who began to think that we were planning a coup d'etat. Yes. Were we planning a coup d'etat, Clinton? Well, well, they thought, they thought with all that talent out there, if those fellows decided to form a political party and come to Dominica, they are likely to wipe us out. So in order to avoid the wipeout, we got to avoid these guys. Yes, yes. Well, do you consider the Botanic Gardens website and our work, I know we provided about maybe $30,000 or more in equipment and inputs and supplies to the Botanic Gardens, aside from the website, we also held symposia, and as well, you uh, arrange with your contacts at the Smithsonian to bring Dominican students from the State College to the Smithsonian Museum of Natural History in Washington to study plant science. Is that correct? Correct. No, we, 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 did, we did a lot uh, of game with the, with the organizational strength that we had. We had those two soccer tournaments. We had a guest lecture series at the Dominica State College. We were in close contact with the senior persons at the Botanical Gardens, including buying them equipment to keep the gardens in order. We did, we did all of that. We did a whole lot of things, a whole lot of things. And, and, and many of us like yourself and myself went home and built homes in Dominica to encourage Dominicans to build exactly. homes in Dominica. Exactly. Because, because of the attachment <clears throat> to the island of our birth, many of us went and built homes in Dominica with the intention of spending when we were in a position to do so, spending significant amount of time on the island and helping in the various areas that we had started working with the DAS, we would have been able to expand what we had proposed in the DAS to practical use. That was one of the key things and uh, it just didn't work out. Indeed. Well, what are you, what, what do you, when you look at the uh, Botanic Gardens, you've been there in recent times, what do you see as compared to its heyday as you remember it? And what are your views on its future utilization? Well, I think <clears throat> the Botanical Gardens as an institution, the way it was set up, that should be kept intact. It's not a good idea to go and interfere with that structure because the interference of that structure what it will do is it will set us back from something that was set up with a specific purpose. And if you go now and you interfere with that basic structure and the functions that the gardens was supposed to perform, you are going to create confusion. And that confusion is not going to be to the benefit of Dominica, no, to the benefit of Dominicans. You know, Clayton, I, uh, when I heard the comments made about the plans, miniature golf, water park, cinema, and all of those things, restaurant shops, I realized that to succeed, you need to be seized in life by a degree of gravitas in understanding, I say gravitas, I mean seriousness, in understanding history, in understanding heritage, and in particular in the 21st century, understanding the role of science. When I say science, all sciences, yes. in particular the botanic sciences, because we as human beings run on fuel called food. 
And we have the capacity in Dominica to be, um, maybe not in all things, but we have a capacity to do a lot in food security, but it requires a studied effort. It requires a studious approach. And to take the Botanic Gardens and turn it into a mall or into some entertainment facility seems to me to underline the very cavalier, bacchanalia, celebratory party atmosphere, which is mindless, it's mind numbing, it is childish, it is actually just so grossly negligent in not understanding the basics of nation building, which means understanding the sciences, understanding disciplined effort, and the application of studied and purposeful living. And in my view, that approach is also why the people talking about golf could not spell the word properly. They spelled golf, which is the game G-O-L-F. Clayton, it was spelled in some of the documents I saw, G-U-L-F, which is like a Gulf of Arabia, body of water, Gulf of Mexico, and so on. And the library that you knew, the Dominican Public Library, which was gifted to us by Andrew Carnegie, is also seven years after Hurricane Maria in ruins, sir. Are you aware of that? Yes. So that. any comment? Well, my, my, first, my first concern regarding the, the library was there are a lot of important documents in their books and so on. The Smithsonian, many of the Smithsonian uh, research papers were there. There was an archival area where books were kept special. You could only have access to the books in the library. You couldn't borrow them. So my master's degree, for example, on the rainforest was there. And when all this was going on, it began to occur to me that many of those books would have been lost either because people took them out and they had no way to find where these books went. But the other thing that was of importance here is when you say to the world that you are the nature island of the Caribbean, that has a meaning. Nature island means that your natural environment reflects the thing you say you are, which means the forest and the rivers and the waterfalls and all of that. Now, if you proceed to destroy all of that, the rivers are gone to hell. You want to chop down all the forests. You cannot then turn around and say, I'm the nature island. Doesn't work. Doesn't work. Clayton, any final words? I mean, for young Dominicans coming up into the value system that made for your success, and also any words on the future of the Botanic Gardens and future use? Well, Gabe, you know, as I just mentioned, when you say you are the nature island of the Caribbean, and maybe you go so far as to say, you are the nature island beyond the Caribbean. When you go and you say that, the picture that you must present to the visitor has to be consistent with the title you gave yourself. And unfortunately, what we, the title we are using and our own behavior towards the, our nature are moving very rapidly one apart from the other. Well, that doesn't work very well. When you say nature island, you have to protect the forest. So you must have areas where people are not supposed to go and participate in any activity. And the botanical gardens is one and you should have areas in the natural vegetation that are also protected because 
I know that right here in the United States, where there are natural areas that the government wants to protect, they pass a law and they call this place a, a park of some kind. And you can't go in there and tamper the plants. Hayden, um, let me ask you, in all your years, has this government in the past 23 years ever invited you, sir, apart from the diaspora policy people, to any symposium on botanic science and the botanic gardens? No. Have they ever invited you, sir, to serve on any committee concerning the development of the botanic gardens? No. Have they ever called you once to talk about the banana development, banana de uh, enhancement, protection of the banana industry or the planting industry? No. Have they done anything to bring Dominicans of intelligence, competence back to Dominica to serve in any position which is not based on partisan politics? Well, you, you, know, you know, Gabe, there are two points here. One is that <clears throat> we have a lot of people who are qualified in various areas, and this was all captured in the policy paper that we presented to the Prime Minister's carrot. So that, that, that was one thing. Unfortunately for us, the government took the position that our interest in Dominica was to challenge them politically, and therefore, the further they stayed away from us, for them, the better. And how has the country done by cutting off its links to its uh, well-educated men and women overseas? Well, you know, you know how it is. If you want to develop a country, a small island, you need to bring all the brains that are available to you together to be able to plan and to project the things that are important. If you don't bring the brains together, you're not going to go anywhere. You're not going to go anywhere. You see, that's why some places in the world have been able to advance. Countries like Israel, why do they move forward? They move forward because not only do they tap the talent that is resident there, they tap all of their talent that is overseas. That's the same can be said of Singapore, the same can be said of India, Singapore. the same can be said of South Korea, Indeed. the same can be said of even China. You know, Indeed. these countries uh, respect their overseas populations, Ireland, the same thing, yeah. and they uh, partner with their overseas populations. Any final words on the sanctions that Britain, you know, Dominicans could go to Britain without any visa. You know, Dominica has now been sanctioned right. because they said that the government has been abusing the sale of passports. Any comments on that? Well, the British government, though they would look to see where they could be able to fill certain sectors of their social structure to give them some economic advantage. They were not interested in people coming into the place that would create any kind of confusion. So somebody who is holding a Dominican passport, but where, where is he from prior to get in that passport has nothing to do with Dominica. The British government wasn't about to go and deal with all of that. So naturally, they put a block. So you're saying to Dominica, that the, you're saying to us rather that the British government knew who Dominicans were, what they were capable of, and how they had distinguished themselves in war and in peace as productive, intelligent, and law-abiding people and that the people they were seeing coming, posing as if they were Dominicans, they were not interested in that kind of Dominican. Correct. Okay. Correct. Now, Clayton, um, I believe that reputation precedes you, just like it precedes a nation or a business. And what we have to do is continue to do our best to hold up the best of our reputation as people of law and order, as people of intelligence, 
and urge all people in Dominica to do likewise. Because like with the Botanic Gardens, where we tried to help, we didn't talk about it. We put our time and our money behind it. And I want to take a moment now, Clayton. I'm happy that Ms. Christian and I came down to salute both you and uh, Brother uh, Davidson Schillingford in April of this year. At that time, we did not know there was going to be a controversy about the Botanic Gardens. But I'm happy that we've been able to salute you and Dave as nation builders. We ask for God to bless both of you. And I just want to take this moment to put up this flag here. This is a flag you recognize. Very nice. That, that was done by my English teacher, Alvin Bully. Yes. We remember him because Mr. Bully also was someone who loved the Botanic Gardens and his brother, Colin Bully, was at one time, I think the director of agriculture. Um, Correct. Did, did you know Mr. Bully? Did he go to school with you or was he one of your students? I taught those fellows, man. I taught Colin, uh, uh, Dave, uh, you know, we, I did the, the botany with them at the time they were in 4-4. Amazing. Before I went to UWI, because Please. I came into the grammar school when Asher was there, Asher invited me to come and teach because I was one of his best students. At the time I was working in the custom department and the gentleman called me and said, you come back here to teach. So I see. at that time, Dave and Colin were in the fourth form. So I did instruction according to Asher's syllabus. I did instruction to younger students at that time. Yeah. Clayton, I want to thank you for being not only a botanist, but also a sports master and a science teacher at the grammar school. And um, any names of famous Dominican scientists, especially in the botanic sciences that you taught. I know you went to school with J. Bernard Yankee, who went to the University of Wisconsin at Madison. Any other names? I know there's a Donnie Robinson and a Henderson. Any names? Well, Donnie Robinson, Fellas like uh, Wendell Lawrence and all of these guys, you know, they went, many of them went to Trinidad to what was the Imperial College of Tropical Agriculture and then became the faculty uh, of science, but also Department of Agriculture at UWI Trinidad. And many of these guys went there. And that is where they got their degrees in agriculture. Indeed, indeed. Well, Clayton, I'm going to wrap it up now. I've kept you much longer than planned, but it's been an extremely productive afternoon. I'm very delighted that I got to speak with you. I know that you have your challenges, but your record is impeccable in that way of in way of service, not only to uh, Dominica, but Jamaica and the entire Caribbean, in fact, the entire uh, world for what you've done for food security. We ask God to always bless and keep you and we honor you, sir. Very well. Well, Jim, once more, thank you very much for the opportunity to allow me the room for me to express my views and to be able to state more clearly what I feel about agriculture and the place of the botanical gardens in Dominica. Thank you very much. God bless you, sir. Okay. I will provide you with a copy of this, and I want to let you know that uh, we urge you on to the completion of your biography, which I think will be a tour de force and will be a very welcome piece of literature uh, for the illumination of our young minds, uh, to, to have them know that within each and every one of us resides the opportunity to be excellent in all that we put our minds to focus on. So thank you again. Thanks, Gabe.